Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> and so uh, we're live. I am now in Copenhagen with, you know, no pressure. God herself. No, no. <laughs> Robin Molsa. We are, um, we, we got to show this. We were having a school here. Uh, wherever you are, you know, have yourself a drink or a shrimp cocktail or cup of tea, whatever is convenient for you. And so this is like two girls hanging out, uh, having a little chat about things that are important to us. Just let's start with the school oh, right. and let's have a little, that. you know, yes. And if you're there, it kind of feels like we're literally, the computer's on a box and we're like staring <laughs> into like space. So if you're there, you know, please send comments and hellos and waves and, you know, skulls and whatever, so that we feel like you were there with us and welcome if you're there live welcome if you watch this afterwards um you know we're just happy that you're here so uh for those of you who don't know me i'm ricky uh, i am a psychologist i run a training and supervision company here in scandinavia and i have the pleasure of this week uh, hello michelle uh, of this week hosting um a two-year training program you know, part of a two-year training program where Robin is here giving supervision and training. So you want to introduce yourself to those who don't know you? Uh, sure. My name is Robin Walser. I'm a psychologist. I live in the United States and practice in California. I have a private consultation business, business there where I do uh, supervision and consultation on ACT as well. I work at the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder and I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley, California. So I have lots of jobs and um, I'm very happy to be here with Ricky today and to talk about uh, all kinds of things. So. One of the things we are going to talk about is this little baby here. This is one of your babies, right? Yes, it's a baby. The Heart of Act. This was recently published, wasn't it? it just came out. Just, just came out. The end of the year. Yeah. That's true. So, hello. <laughs> Good to see you all. Thank you for all the comments. Hello. So this is the heart of ACT. So just before we talk about you know, this book, could you tell us a little bit, what is ACT? Well, so acceptance and commitment therapy is considered a third wave behavioral therapy. And essentially it's built into the name. We're looking at acceptance of internal experience, not necessarily situations, but opening up to uh, what you feel, think, and sense. Uh, in a way that moves you forward uh, with respect to commitments and values. So we want to define values in acceptance and commitment therapy and get people in line with those while they uh, carry their emotional thought and sensation experience forward. So uh, one of the uh, pillars or three pillars of ACT are open, aware, and engaged. And that's just a very brief introduction about what it is that we're trying to do in acceptance and commitment therapy. Hopefully, I mean, you know this well, I mean, hopefully folks will have read some about it. There's lots of books. And so how, tell me about this book. Why, you know, why did you write this one? Because I know you've written a lot of books. Yeah. 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 Uh, this book in particular, uh, because I was interested in trying to describe process, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I open up the book, I talk about the problem of diffusion of innovation, which basically means as the more you spread an intervention or an innovation, the more it becomes diffuse. Mm -hmm. And so in, what happens in that is you can become overly technicized. You may have seen this a bit in uh, mindfulness or use of compassion where it's popular and people will do things like just talk about the techniques and give um, standard interventions that feel a bit canned and then say that they're doing the intervention and uh, I'm hoping to draw people back to the process of therapy including the interpersonal relationship and what's happening for people intrapersonally and thinking about case conceptualization and functional analysis across time. So that um, is what I want to focus on. And there's two key, in the book, that's what I want to focus on. There's two key pieces there that have to do with our existence and what it means to be human 
and I said what it means to like, have a heart and step forward in your life and uh, existence and process, I suppose, are what I'm focusing on. And so I remember, because I've been to, I think, so many of your trainings, first of all, because you've been here, and whenever I get to go to a, you know, if you ever get the chance to go to a Robin Walser training, you want to go to a Robin Walser training, you are like, I know, I know, you know, this is probably uncomfortable for you because, you know, you feel a lot of pressure, but you are, to me, uh, the trainer's trainer and one of those people who have ta taught me the most in life in general and also uh, as a um, act trainer. And one of the things, I, I, I remember so many things that you taught me, but one of the things uh, is, you, I, 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 we were at a training and you were talking about this eyes on exercise. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to p tell people about this example? Because I think it's both quite funny and a little sad and you know interesting at the same oh, I, time. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember what happened to you specifically, so maybe you can uh, spark my memory on that. But within the eyes exercise, it's generally a willingness exercise where you what, what is the eyes on it? You might want to tell people, what, yeah. is, what is the eyes on exercise? It, when you actually look into each other's eyes for a period of time, letting whatever shows up during that time show up. And essentially, it's a way to demonstrate willingness that I'll stay in the presence of another human being while I'm feeling what I'm feeling and expose myself to those kinds of experiences, yet stay present and connected. So. Just an example of what we mean by being open and committed. And so one of the things I remember you was telling me that you met somebody who did an eyes on exercise without really knowing why. <laughs> yes, yeah. so this, uh, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about it, in the book is they saw the particular technique used in a workshop and then did it but didn't know why they were doing it and so it was very confusing for the client confusing for the therapist as well and it's the kind of thing that can happen when you get a canned or overly technicalized approach and i'm not saying that doing the exercises is uh, not a, it's not a bad thing like that's where people should start and really think about how to implement those exercises and metaphors etc all the things that you do in it but you should never stop there. Like, it's a rich, textured, process-based intervention. And uh, something that I continue to learn, and I've been doing this since 1991, and there's, if you allow yourself to sort of open up to the creative part of it and stay with the process-based part of it, you never get bored. But if you just do the canned pieces, like now I have to do the eyes on exercise, or now I got to deliver this metaphor, or this is the thing to say when the client is fused, or this is the thing to do when you're trying to uh, do self as context or perspective taking, then you lock yourself into an overly routinized therapy. And it, in my opinion, sort of takes the heart and beauty out of the therapy when you're in that place. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I get that a lot uh, as a trainer that people come back to me and they say, so uh, I did the passengers on the bus or uh, I did uh, the eyes on or, you know, I did uh, Joe the bum, whatever. And so I did that. And what, what would your response to that be? Like, I did them. I did a method. I did an exercise. Hence, I did that. <laughs> well, so I would say you did a teeny tiny portion of that and I don't want to be thoughtful and gentle here. You've got to start somewhere. And indeed, it's where I started. I started with the protocol and I looked at the metaphors and exercises and I memorized them and implemented them in sessions, but I didn't stop there. And really uh, uh, would encourage someone who says that I did the bus metaphor and so I'm doing act to um, push themselves to go much, much further with the, ex with the uh, therapy if you can have a rich, fluid, contextualized, functional therapy uh, without it being a can, but it does mean more work on the part of the person learning the intervention. I just think it's uh, worth it in terms of what you experience in the therapy, what the client experiences, and what the possibilities are as the client steps out into the world and uh, sure. faces their own interpersonal struggles and uh, uh, relationships and that kind of thing. Could you tell me about, because I know the work that you're doing is highly experiential. Um, so um, even, I think, 
I haven't seen you, you know, for the first, for the last uh, uh, few years, I haven't seen you actually do a lot of exercises. I see you working more like process based yeah. and still everything you are doing is highly experiential. Um, could you say a little bit about that? How do you work experientially without, you know, administering one metaphor after the other? What does that look like out when you're actually doing your magic? What does that look like? I think it's a slightly hard to describe and part of why I wrote The Heart of Act is you're, um, I'm trying to describe something that's challenging to do, but if you think about maybe four levels of process at least, and maybe there's more, at least starting there with what are you experiencing internally? So there's an ongoing and fluid process there. What's happening in between you and the client? There's an ongoing and fluid process there. Like nothing stays the same. You're moving and talking and generating content and material. And then where are you going from beginning to end? And what is the overarching process or the ongoing change that's happening as you and the client are um, moving toward their resiliency, their values-based living, whatever the case might be. And so as I'm thinking about what I'm doing with the client to bring that fluidity into place, I'm thinking, what are the patterns of behavior that the person is demonstrating? And uh, what are the um, pathological processes that are involved here, like maybe avoidance or fusion? And then what process am I going to bring? And how am I going to get myself and our relationship going all at the same time. So it sounds challenging, but once you get rolling, uh, you can actually make it a full process. And I'd say the key thing is that I'm really assessing in the background, what is the function of this behavior? What is the function of this behavior? What, uh, what are the function of the client? What are the patterns of, of clients' behaviors that are getting them stuck and in trouble? And how can we shift the function? And so the fluidity is um, sort of stands. What stands behind that is functional analysis. So, um, I, of course, I want to address the content, like what is the client saying about their experience. I want to hear about that. But inside of that, I'm looking for patterns of behavior, how that's functioning. So it sounds to me like you're doing like this constant functional analysis and all the time like assessing, uh, you know, the function and yeah. shaping. And shaping. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So reinforcing what I think is going to be more workable, not reinforcing what isn't workable, mm -hmm. pointing out the patterns to the client, seeing how I feel and giving direct contingency safe feedback. So here's what I hear and this is how it's impacting me. And the only way to do that is to know what's going on inside my own skin. I, of course, have to be able to discern is this something that I say now or not? Because if it's not in the service of the client, then I don't want to say mm -hmm. it. Sure. Uh, I want it to be in the service of the client, whatever's happening internally. So I might say something like, I notice uh, anxiety rising within me as you share this experience. Uh, what do you notice for yourself? So mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. uh, interactive. And then I want to give feedback to the client about their you know, processes and what's happening for them. So I don't want just the what's happening in the session to be the only place where they're learning and I want them to take it outside the session and do work uh, in order to have their lives grow outside the session as well as inside the session. Nice. Did I answer the question? I, yeah, you did. You did. Okay. And and two of the things that strikes me as I sit here and watch you and listen to you is like uh, things I've thought about. Um, I often think, what would Robin do? <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. And unless uh, it takes you astray. No, no, no. <laughs> I would take then, then don't do it. <laughs> it seems to be working. But it, yeah. there are two things that strikes me, like when I look at your, you know, a, apart from your huge knowledge, uh, in act, there, there's also this kind of personal, like, style, like, like behavioral repertoire, like a Robin behavioral repertoire. And two things. There's so much. You, let me just say, you are so funny. I don't see that in therapy, obviously. Not. Well, not, well, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes yeah. Funny. Humor but you know, is good. <laughs> I know you once, and so many, you know, privately as well. You're one of the most funny <laughs> versions I really know. It's just so funny. What strikes me out when you're doing therapy is two, uh, two, two things. The one is that you're very brave. Like mm -hmm. you're not afraid of telling the person what shows up for you, and you know, and also like giving feedback uh, that is. Uh, 
you know, that could be hard. Yeah. So you're very brave. And another thing that strikes me is that you care. Like, if, if, you know, you care so much about people and, you know, the people that you work with. And I just love that combination of bravery and care. Like, so you are, you will be direct, you will be, um, uh, you'll tell them, uh, it's like you have a bullshit detector. <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we say that? We can say that. So, but you will, you will, you will get pretty direct feedback uh, in the service of moving them somewhere. And then you care deeply about them. Have you noticed that? You know, well, I get told that frequently is that what I'm doing is bold or brave. And um, I think part of what that, another thing that, I've put in the heart of act, which I is probably certainly other people have thought about this, but uh, has been uh, with me for a long time is this idea of our existence yeah. and how much time we have on Earth. And so, I even as a as a youngster when I was in graduate school did my one of my projects on existentialism from a behavioral perspective, and one of the things that guides me in terms of the boldness or bravery is we're all running out of time. And that it seems important to me a good deal of the time, unless it's functionally not so, which could happen, is uh, to move rapidly with clients and to you know, get our feet going uh, in ways that we care about and value, because truly life passes us by very quickly. And, I think that existence is what gives us meaning, and existence is short. And so I suppose some of that bravery and boldness is about connecting to let's make it happen mm -hmm. in the time that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's also a values-based process for me. Is when I'm, when, if you're in the room in an authentic uh, and um, present way with someone, you, and you care for them, it gives you permission to be more bold. And I think sometimes therapists are a little afraid to say some of what they actually do want to say because they're, um, they're not being willing themselves. And so this is one of the things, like in the book, I'm saying a lot about what do you need to work on as a therapist in order to be present with your clients in a wholehearted and bold way. And I think values and a short time here is probably a part of what motivates me to do that. So it comes from a very sincere place. And I'm not just being bold for the mm -hmm. sake of being bold. I'm being bold in the service of helping the client to break out of the rigidity that's keeping them stuck. Yeah, because there's there's different ways of being bold. I get that, and you're you know for sure very very authentic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It comes from that. I hope like, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what what I've seen, it's very authentic, <laughs> and it comes from a genuine <laughs> place, genuine place of care, and like boldness in the service of you know helping that person. Mm -hmm. You do have a. There are so many, uh, you know, things that I, I think about when, as, you know, when you do the, when you teach and when you do act. You use self-disclosure a lot, I've noticed. Uh, many of us who are uh, um, teaching at are, uh, are using self-disclosure. And I have so, so many times people ask me, how do I use self-disclosure? How much can I disclose? Mm -hmm. what, would, what would Robert wants to do? What would Robert wants to say to that? Uh, I would say it depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a response I, I often give. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not always what people want to hear, right? They, want to get a rule about it. But we want a recipe. The recipe. Yes. But the rule is the problem. Flexibility. I mean, of course, rules are good and healthy for us. But if we're just following rules, if we're rigidly following rules, then uh, we're going to create difficulties for ourselves and as a therapist in the therapy room, too. So uh, we want to break the rules a little bit. Yes. And uh, that's Part of self-disclosure because you know if you think about how many of us are trained, you don't self-disclose, you don't talk about yourself. It's actually a core competency inside of that is that you uh, do self-disclosure. The key way I assess self-disclosure is: is this in the service of the client? Yeah. And if I think it's going to be about me and it's serving a purpose for me, I don't self-disclose. But if it's in the service of the client, I do. Um, you can't always know that whether that's correct or not and the only way to know is see what comes next and if what comes next is an opening and something that feels more positive and moving in the right direction 
then good. But if it's something that sort of closes things down and the client gets silent and in a way they, they look like they've disconnected because you've said something about yourself, uh, then it's reassess and see if you need to steer in a different direction. Here's to breaking the rules. Here's to breaking the rules. <laughs> Skull. Skull. So if you're with us, just, you know, wave, say hello. If you have questions, you know, we, we, we can see, well, if we get close enough, <laughs> we can see that, it, we can see your comments. If you have questions, please ask questions. Um, it's just fun to interact with you, even though we're kind of sitting here in a, in a box, <laughs> in a Copenhagen box. In a Copenhagen box. Yeah. So, oh, oh, sorry. One, one question I, I, I did get from, from um, Karina, Karina yeah. uh, before we went on here, that, uh, which is such a good question. She said, what would Robin Wolf? This is this is a new saying. What would Robin Wolf do? <laughs> and, and it's a it's a little bit embarrassing. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to be to yeah. to break the heels to break the rule. We can okay. break that rule. We can be embarrassing. Yeah. And of course, I I get that. Sometimes it's um, I notice we have sometimes it's easier for us to give credit to others mm -hmm. than accepting it ourselves. Yeah. I think maybe that's what's going on right oh, yeah. now. <laughs> to me, you are. So precious. Thank you. Uh, and well, and Karina's question, which is so good, she'd say, uh, she, she's asking, what do you say when a client comes in and says, can you give me some tools so that I can fix this, please? What would Robin Walsh say? Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really does depend. Yes. And so uh, it depends on a couple of things like what does the clients uh, um, uh, mean by tools uh, are these things that are going to help them op open be repetitive moving forward because certainly there are uh, tools that we have in our toolbox, in our toolbox mm -hmm. that help us do those kinds of things but typically when a client is asking something like that they're running from their own sadness or fear or anxiety or whatever they're describing. Like, give me toolbox for happiness is about, let me get away from the things that I don't like. And so then I'm probably going to look at their struggle with trying to get away from happiness or get away from the things they don't like and move towards happiness. I should say I'm a fan of happiness and I think that moving towards um, resiliency, repetitive processes and a purpose, all of those things are really important, but sometimes you have to get people to let go of old habits and uh, focus on things like where is control getting in the way. So I might instead do a little bit of uh, what we call creative focus and so really just undermining uh, excessive and problematic control. And I want to do it in a compassionate way. I want to hammer people without their control. And so creative hopelessness, I think well, some of you will refer to you as Mrs. <laughs> creative hopelessness um, and and surely it's one of my you know uh, it, you know that rings <laughs> it resonates with me because it's a process that is so difficult for many of us to sit in not only is it difficult uh, for the client but it also can be difficult for the therapist to to be in that space where you're not trying to fix anything particularly because the client is asking you to fix it and so I've had the pleasure of, um, you know, attending your workshops and actually we've been presenting together yes, <laughs> a few can. times. Yeah. Uh, and what strikes me is that you are like, it, maybe this is the bravery and the caring part again. You will not back down. Like I've seen people and this can be like out of context, I'm like crying in the breaks because they are asking, please Robin, you know, say something that will make this go away. So could you tell us a little bit about creative, what is it, and, and how do we in, endure, how do we stay brave and caring while not taking away discomfort? Well, uh, so let me just say that even though creative focuses can feel hard for people, uh, if, if your grip on control is so tight that all you want to do is control, like, I'm not saying control is bad. No. Like it's, if control is uh, bringing you the things that you want in your life and uh, seems fun by me, we shouldn't tackle it. Uh, but the, um, 
when I'm leaning in like that, it's hard. I feel anxious too. And I really need to convey that it's not in the service of creating some sort of aversive process. It's in the service of breaking free. Uh, so for instance, uh, I've done this work with veterans who've been just you know, hell-bent on trying to eliminate symptoms of anxiety or fear or hyperarousal, whatever it is that they're experiencing. They've been in therapy for 25, you know, 30 years or something like that. And they're invested in figuring out ways to just get it to stop, like hyper invested. And it makes sense because they're, you know, they come from traumatic histories. They've been struggling for a long time. Often um, they have problems in their relate all of their relationships. And so the, the work here isn't to make it worse when I'm doing kind of like this. The work is to let go, to open up to feel free from control. And so um, I see it as a as a repetitive process itself. As a, in fact, I've done it with some veterans where in the end they say, even when we, they have tears and it's hard, we get sort of past that, they're like, I feel relieved. Yeah. I feel able to, if I do feel like I don't, I don't have to do this thing that I've been doing anymore. And so there is a sense in that where, um, Therapists can go, oh, it looks terrible, it looks aversive, and it looks that kind of thing. You know, if, if you pursue it to the point of, I have hope for you, yes. the human being, that you, that you can make a difference in your life that's powerful and significant, really matters to you, like, if, like that's why I carry it forward, because I want to get to that place. It's not like you just do, it. this is the problem, and part of why I talk about the problem of just techniques in the book. So if you just do the creative hopelessness technique and sort of follow it by the book, and you're not functionally looking at yeah. what's happening for the client, you it could be experienced as sure. just an aversive thing, or people will watch it and um, uh, like start getting worried themselves and say, oh, I'd never do that thing. But what we're trying to do is like create space and openness. Yeah rather than shut people down and tell them they're wrong. Like, that's not the purpose. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be watching the function of that as you go through. And if you watch and you can see people sort of getting to a place where, okay, I'm, I don't know, but like it feels less constricted. Mm -hmm. And it can feel less constricted experientially mm -hmm. or psychologically. Then you're doing that work. Yes. And I've heard some people say things like, I don't need to do creative hopelessness, right? Or they've actually given the message that they don't need to, uh, you know, somebody told me I don't need to do creative hopelessness. But anytime you're undermining control, yeah. that's what you're doing. Yeah. That's what creative hopelessness is. So yeah. if you're undermining control, you're doing creative hopelessness. And I think people get that confused with the exercises inside creative hopelessness yeah. and the purpose of creative yeah. hopelessness. And some people might even think that you'd be free to focus it in the beginning and then that's it. That then right. you're over it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're done. <laughs> and then you're done. And you know, creative hopelessness is a process that we come back to every time the person is in the, you know, control agenda, right? Yeah, yeah. And what I think is cool about this is like it can seem now if, if you look at it and don't get the function, uh, it can look a bit harsh because you'll be, you know, uh, you'll be you all the time we'll be pointing to the hopelessness of the strategy, not the person, but the strategy. And whilst you're doing it, this, and this is what I think is the, like the, the fine, um, this is the, the, uh, um, the way, this is the, oh, what can we say? The, the thing you want to bring to creative hopelessness is, is that you, as a therapist, are the vicacious hope. Like you said that you have hope for the person. So you have no hope for his or her strategies, you know, the unworkable strategies, but you do have hope for the person. And that's why I think that you portray so beautifully as you do this. It might seem, you know, uh, hard because you will not back down. When I say you will not back down, I mean the times where people are going, but I can do this, or maybe we could do that. And you go, well, you know, yeah, yeah. 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 have you tried your, it? Have yeah. you tried it? What does yeah. your experience tell you? Um, so you're not, you, you know, not you, but when we do creative hypothesis, sometimes we doesn't we don't come across as a particular nice person because we don't say the things that people want to hear, right? 
I suppose people might see us, and I mean, I've certainly had questions asked like, um, don't you think the client will take this as uh, yeah. too harshly? Mm -hmm. And how can, how, you know, what are, where are we leaving them? I even yeah. had a friend of mine, and this is kind of funny, who said, um, it looks like you're doing scorched earth therapy. <laughs> Scor <laughs> what is it? Scorched earth. I you don't know, even like know. burning everything. Oh, okay. Like scorched earth. <laughs> okay. And, um, and I really want to convey that creative hopelessness should you know, be done with compassion yes. and should feel like it's opening something up, not closing something down. Yeah. And uh, so that's, I can't say enough about that. And, um, and I think clinicians are afraid to, to do it because if you're not understanding the function and you're just asking, did that work, did that work, did that exactly. work? Exactly. Then people, then it can look like you're trying to just close people down. And yeah, that's not the purpose and not what we're trying to do with this work. And one of the things that, you know, when you actually, sometimes I refer to as a sitting on your hands, like mm -hmm. not trying to fix anything. What you're also doing is modeling the model, which I think is one of the things that you do so brilliantly. And I know this is, this is, you, what your book is about as well to not just talk about it but to actually do it yeah. i think that is the, that is the heart of that yeah, yeah. doing the processes and not describing them and, and you know teaching people yeah yeah no the uh, if people can arrive at it from a, a contingency shaped place and they can get the sense of something uh, things uh, you know like there's an experiential quality here and Part of why I struggled to write this book, uh, as I was writing it, it's like trying to just put words on top of experience, yes. and the words always fall short. Yeah, like I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote some of what I was trying to describe, and it just, I just have to recognize that it's always going to fall short because uh, we don't have the words for experience. We don't can't always describe what's going on inside. And contingency shaping has that quality too. Like you don't, it's not always something that you can just say what's exactly happening. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, looking for movement forward and you're looking at what's happening next, right? Like, are things opening? Are things closing? Um, uh, is there a rigidity in what the client's doing? Mm -hmm. And why, are they engaging in their uh, values, the committed actions after your therapy sessions? Like those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for and thinking about. And you can see it right in the session. You, whether you're doing creative hopelessness work or just using the entire model to uh, uh, move someone, um, I think that, uh, or to influence someone in ways that are healthy, uh, you'll, you can detect it as you're in the room if you're paying attention to yourself. And what, is, what does that mean? Because I don't, you know, many, many people, um, including myself, are often so busy trying to figure out what to help, what would Robin do? <laughs> what, you know, what do I do? Uh, how do I go further? What do I say? Or so forth. And it seems to me when I watch you work, like you are so present, like you are there. What, can you say something about that? Uh, yes. Let's see. If so, I'm like, if I'm like, just crazy worried about what to do next, might I be missing something? Then? Potentially, uh, what can happen for clinicians in the therapy room is they get caught up in the next good technique. Yes. Uh, or they get like they're thinking so much about what they should be doing that they lose the client, yes. and they miss like important facial or bodily cues, or even some of what they're saying that can point to uh, the function of the behavior. So being present in the room, and this is why I think that as uh, practitioners of ACT, we need to practice ACT. Yes. So that we can get in the room with the client in an open, aware, and engaged way. Like that is the, the path. And so I'm hopeful, and this is what I try to do when I'm in the room with clients, is to be fully present, uh, listening with intent, uh, uh, listening uh, from like a wholeness of myself, not just with my ears, listening to their body language, listening to the experience in the room, listening to what's happening between us, 
And from that space, then what to do next flows a little bit more. Hmm. If you're not caught here in what technique should I use, then yeah. you're present here. Now, you, you got to, of course, get the therapy under your belt mm -hmm. and spend time really understanding the theoretical pieces of it and um, you know, what it means to uh, be present yourself. Practicing uh, present moment work, I think, can be really important. Um, and moving away from these kinds of um, popish notions of what mindfulness is or what mm -hmm. compassion is and think about it as uh, expanding repertoires that are more aware like I know what's happening in my environment and I know what's happening inside my skin I'm conscious of it I guess is what I should say by knowledge and that that creates a freedom for me to take, make choice versus what I'm not and if I'm doing that in the room I'll have much more choice in yes. which direction I can go so I can I mean, fluently bring in any process at that point Hopefully, I'm using the ones that target the function, right? Sure, so that, yeah. um, you know, that process, those those six core processes are in the room. Um, and I think it just is practice, you know, starting with the techniques and then moving to processes. If I'm really going, to, what is your relationship like? What do you notice yourself? What do you notice happening to yourself in the room? Mm -hmm. I think those things are are just as important because we're shaped by our clients as well. Yes, we. Mm -hmm. Like we sometimes just think about ourselves as influencing, right? but our, our clients are definitely influencing us. This is a two-way deal, not a, not a no, I'm influencing no. them and no. they're not influencing me. No, yeah. they're both, they're all part of the context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Robin, what is, um, you know, I, I sometimes think of, of myself and, and act and, you know, for me, the model has been like a game changer in my life, both the way I work and you know the way I uh, am, or the way I behave in this yeah. world. Why, why act? You know, you could have easily done, you know, something else. Huh? What's, what's, you know, why act? What does that mean? Well, I initially started doing something else. Yeah. I was a big C, little beer. Oh, right? yeah. I was in the cognitive of the human. <laughs> I'm not even gonna put this on tape, but. Should I just put it? We put on, okay. <laughs> I hope Steve Hayes knows that, okay. I once even made fun of Skinner, like. Oh, you made fun yeah, of Skinner? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, cheers. cheers to breaking the rules. <laughs> Robin also made fun of Skinner. <laughs> because I was like, he doesn't pay attention to conditions. <laughs> but that was a, or what goes on, that was a, I didn't know, really. I didn't understand Skinner. So it was an uninformed. Uh, uh, uninformed joke. And from criticism, criticism, yeah. and to, and then uh, you know through my training, I learned so much more, yeah. and um, uh, has influenced me highly. And I think probably the thing that made the biggest difference for me coming out of this big C is I was still I was suspicious of it, even though I was doing it, and I, I criticized uh, Skinner in an unknowing way is I was suspicious of this idea that people have dysfunctional, irrational, problematic thoughts that are, like it didn't sit right with me just as a youngster when I was first getting my master's degree. I always felt like, why are we, like there's a critical voice about the critical voice. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, just that. And so then I attended an ACT workshop with Steve Hayes and when I got into graduate school up in Reno, and it just influenced me substantially. And like it made so much sense in terms of our relationship with our internal experience. And that, what if thoughts are not dysfunctional? What if behaviors are problematic because they give us some trouble? But the thoughts themselves are not dysfunctional or irrational, they're simply learned. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, through relating, we can derive all these different kinds of things about our world and ourselves mm -hmm. in ways that are painful and hard. And it doesn't mean that you're a broken person. Mm -hmm. And because of the history that I come from, I was relieved, uh, tremendously relieved to know that I wasn't a broken person, that my thoughts weren't bad thoughts that I needed to get rid of, they just mm -hmm. were. And so uh, I was saying, I don't know, 
Have you ever had the experience of being poor? I'm taking another drink of mine okay. before you answer that question. <laughs> um, if somebody's around, they should, you know, see that our glass, well, yeah, some glasses, glasses are, are almost <laughs> empty and they should come with me. When I was younger, um, so I come out of a, his, a history of um, domestic violence. My, not me, not my, my mother was uh, um, violated many times uh, through violence. And uh, there was a lot of turmoil in our family as a child. And I remember thinking pretty young, like, how come this is happening to me? And you get this sort of sense of, how can I be inside of this place? And am I wrong or am I bad? You know, you get in trouble for the minutest of things, like things that you and I don't even care about. You could spill a glass of milk and be knocked across the room. And they didn't, so things didn't make sense to me. And so it was sort of broken in the sense of, um, is this the way the world works? And is this what this is about? And uh, uh, Am I a lovable child? Uh, those kinds of things were always sort of with me when I was younger. And um, of course, uh, uh, you know, you can see that happening with many of our clients as well. They come from these places where they feel like they weren't acceptable or lovable mm -hmm. or something traumatic happened and they're now feeling broken, mm -hmm. even though I would say that. You would say they're not. And still, you know that feeling. I do you know, and you, I've seen you use that. That I've seen you. I've seen you in instances where you are. We, we talked about self disclosure just a little while ago, but I've seen you in instances where you do self disclose. And when I watch you, I see instances where you don't tell people about your personal story, yeah. but it's evident that you know, like you use your story without. Putting, you know, without telling it to the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't tell people uh, my history in psychotherapy, but I will convey that I have understood trauma or that I have understood from the inside out the experience of great and many painful events. Um, and it sort of levels that playing field right with you and your client are not so different. Uh, I don't think I can ever fully understand another person's pain because I'm not inside their skin and I don't have their history. Uh, but I can certainly reflect on my own levels of pain and recognize the humanness between us inside of that. Mm -hmm. it, I think it helps with connection. And, you know, your client feels heard. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, but not just, not like I'm reflectively listening kind of heard. heard. Yes. Yeah, I know pain too. Yeah. Not your pain, but I know pain. Mm -hmm. One thing I see you do, Robin, is that you, you pay so much attention to, you know, you use the functional analysis out of the room, you are shaping, you are reinforcing behaviors that you want to grow, that you want to expand, and you're using the relationship between the mm -hmm. two of you so much. Right. Can you just tell us a little bit, how do, how do you do that? You know, if you are out there, you're an act therapist and you want to know, how do I use the relationship between me and my client a little bit more? What would, what would you advise? There's, well, there's some of this bold new stuff in here, and, and sometimes it means um, not responding to clients, mm -hmm. uh, which can be a bold move, not responding to the content of what they're telling you, mm -hmm. or recognizing that the content is another s story that's going to keep them from engaging in the world in ways that feel connected and uh, more uh, uh, vital. Uh, and so I think that revealing yourself in session and looking for you know, the emotions that are happening between you and the client are part of this process. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think of an example, but I can't think of one right off the top of my head. One time, sometimes I think about like this. I have two boys at home. 
Uh, and I remember when I was teaching them to tie their shoes. Yeah. And uh, it was very painful for me. <laughs> because they, were, they would suck at it, you know, <laughs> until they didn't suck. But there's, there's, this, there's, this, like, uh, there's this moment in, in parenting for me when I notice that the kind and loving thing to do right now would be to sit just to to sit with them yeah. in their distress as they're trying to tie their shoes in a shitty well no, no, non-working <laughs> way so it's shitty until it's not shitty right yeah. um and i would sit with them and everything in me in me would be oh take them out of their misery you know do something to help them but the kind and loving thing would be to sit with them uh in their misery uh you know as in the service of you know teaching them to do these difficult things and i see that this is what you sometimes do like people are in a hard place and you sit with them mm -hmm. uh not to watch them like fry yeah, yeah. but to uh have them contact an experience of you know uh doing something different broadening their repertoire yeah. and i just think that it's still you know uh beautiful because <laughs> yeah. it's very loving and kind yeah, when you yeah. sit with them yeah. Well, and if you if you sit with somebody in their pain, they learn that they're it's okay that they're acceptable when they feel this that they don't have to run from it simply because they've been told all their life to run from it. And like if you're willing to hold this, then they can willingly hold it themselves, like a model of holding. And uh, I think that's a and being patient with yourself. Not moving too quickly in the therapy, I think, can be an important part of that. Like, we, you know, the clients demand for us to, like, let's get her done, you know, let's mm -hmm. make this happen. And sometimes the very thing when that's when that's happening is to even slow down more and make lots of room uh, for you know, shaping willingness and mm -hmm. being present. Modeling willingness. Modeling willingness, exactly, and showing them that. And that is, the, that is what is so um, touching and moving about about this is that you know we will sit like what what you are telling your client sometimes in words and sometimes you know in, in gestures is that I can't take away your pain and I can sit with you in it yes. I will sit with you in no matter what shows up which is not too comfort it, I, it's not in the service of comforting yeah but it most of the time, well, most times, what I when I see this, when I see that you do this, this it has the you know a function of actually. Right. So it, it is very soothing, but you're not doing to get too soothed. Right. You're doing it to expand the behavior repertoire, and it's just like beautiful um, clinicianship. I can't use that clinician word. Yeah, clinicianship. Yeah, clinicianship. Clinicianship. Well, so part of what you see there is new learning because yeah. people see these emotions as dangerous, threatening, problematic, un intolerable. But if you sit with them and you get present to them, what you learn is it's none of what your mind says it is. No. Yeah. And so from that space, you if things are not threatening to you, then you don't have to attend to them in the same way that you would attend to something that is actually threatening. Mm -hmm. right? So if you're, you know, if there's a lion, attend to it. Yeah. But feelings are not lions, but we treat them like they are. Mm -hmm. and so if once you sort of have the experience of, oh, this is not as threatening as my mind says it is, it frees you up to turn your attention elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, some of the keywords that we use is flexibility and workability, yeah. right? We want to use like flexible attention. You know, we want if there if there's a lion, you better you know it's, you, <laughs> you might want to run. But you if there's an you know an un, uncomfortable inner experience without the actual lion, you might want to you know attend to that flexibly, yeah. and you know notice whether it's workable or not to to uh, to navigate on that. Although well, I understand, you should never run from a lion. You should <laughs> well, make yourself look really big and okay. kind of scared away. <laughs> At least a cougar, a mountain lion. I've had so little experience <laughs> with, with lions. I would, I'd probably get killed. Yeah, no, make yourself look. And next time you are in the face the of next a lion. Next time I meet a lion. Yes. So this is just, you know, this is a take home message from this webinar, guys. Whenever you meet a lion, you just want to look big. <laughs> oh, so, uh, Robin, you said earlier that you're a fan of happiness. Aren't, you know, we want, yes. of course, we, we, we want folks to be happy or well, you know, happiness has a sort of a, it can have many functions, but what we wish 
for people, not only clients, but for people, like humankind, is to uh, live a rich and meaningful life. And I know that you Google how yes. to be happy. Yes, yeah. You have like, Robin knows how to be happy. Yeah, I Googled it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I am, uh, which by the way, if you Google it, you'll find all kinds of crazy stuff about, you know, smiling a lot and these kinds of things, which I don't think ultimately create happiness. I am a fan of happiness, and I want my clients to experience it, but I know they're not going to experience it at the expense of pain. Mm -hmm. Like if I can eliminate pain, I will then be happy. I, I'm not so sure that's going to be the outcome if you eliminate pain. And w when I think about a rich and textured life, it involves all of those, you know, tasting all of those things that are on the menu, and a if you allow for pain, you make room for joy as well. And so if you're like not allowing the pain, you're probably cutting off the joy. Yeah. And you know, so if, what if we make room for the pain and then we, in, by doing so, we make room for joy as well. We open ourselves up to more of a full and rich human experience. And you know, once I, like I can find joy everywhere. Mm -hmm. like if you get into the moment, and maybe this isn't for everyone, I'll just take on different different um, tones, I guess, for mm -hmm. who's ever uh, doing this, but, you know, I can find joy in the hummingbird, like hovering near the flower, or I can find joy in wrestling with my dogs, or I can, you know, find joy in looking up and seeing a blue sky. And so, I know it'll make a difference for different people, but when you're open and not running from the pain, you actually see more opportunities to experience happiness or joy. It doesn't mean you'll stop the pain, but uh, I would wager if yeah. you're willing to feel pain, you'll have more joy. And the thing, I think what you're saying is so profound, what, you know, uh, that looking for, like, Happiness doesn't come knock on your door, sit in your lap, show up. <laughs> yeah. It's it's in the doing, right? Mm -hmm. You are actually you are choosing to look at the hummingbird. You're choosing to sit down and look at the sunrise or sunset. You're choosing. Um, so, like uh, you were earlier describing your flight over here and you know stuff about that. But there's also a moment of choosing to enjoy the view, or you know, there's all these like. It, it, life doesn't have to be perfect, as you're saying. There's there's pain, there's discomfort, there are you know, all of these stuff. But you can choose to pay attention to to um, to you know other things <laughs> and find joy in that. Right, right. We were talking earlier uh, about things like um, sadness and depression, where people really get stuck. And if you look at what's happening, they quite often lost their ability to be present to the world. Yes. They're tuned in, it's almost like they're tuned in and captured yes. by yes. an inner world that just looks like pain, and they're not like connecting, they're not looking out and seeing, you know, these in the moment things like, you know, hummingbirds yeah. and stuff like that. And so, you know, if, if you can sort of lift up and connect, one, you're more likely to be shaped by the immediate contingencies in that moment. Uh, and uh, two, like there's, uh, it e just even the process of doing that it has the quality of opening. Yeah. Like, it, like with your body, this coming up and uh, being present in the world is different than I am my sadness. Yes. I, you know, kind of yeah. kind of fused and caught and um, so that I like I even like that metaphor. Of, yes. Like coming out into the world and seeing that there's a world. There's somebody. Um, I sometimes see these like act um, uh, illustrations. Somebody drew, and I'm sorry I don't remember the artist, but somebody drew a fantastic picture of this person sitting on, you know, in front of a buffet, like a large table full of all these stuff, mm -hmm. and there's porridge in front of, yeah. of you know, <laughs> and the person just looking out and said, you know, porridge, porridge, porridge. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the thing is that we're inviting people to, uh, to you know, expand their. You, we want, we're looking for expansion of behavioral repertoire, we're looking for expansion of attentional repertoire, yeah, and expansion yeah. of you know, storytelling. And we want people to look, look up and, and you know, notice the entire buffet, and that doesn't mean that everything in the buffet is nice. Right, right. We want to look at more stuff. Um, and I think it's just that great metaphor, like just look up and look and see. And then, you know, our brain is, uh, you know, for most of us, is, the brain is scanning the environment for potential problems all the time. Yeah. 
So there is something beautiful in choosing to scan your environment for beauty <laughs> and for kindness and for connection and for things that we're thankful for. Um, that just, you know, um, that resonates with me, like looking for the hummingbird and choosing to appreciate it. Even though it might be ugly, you know, you know, my your mind might be telling you it's ugly. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Can, you know, even ugly is interesting. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's well, curious. Like say. Yes, <laughs> that's a curious looking thing. What yeah. is that? And what is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I uh, quite um, like that idea. Um, I think curiosity is part of this whole process. Like, sure. What is what is in the world? What is in the skin? Like we want to do both, right? It's a reflection in both places. Um. But I'm worried that curiosity is going to become like mindfulness and compassion. Sure, yes. Like it'll take on that like technique we'll govern. that yeah, we'll yeah, govern, yeah. right? So yeah. sometimes I even hesi hesitate to say it. I have to be curious. <laughs> <laughs> you must be You curious. must be curious. Yeah. Yes. And the, the functions of language, right? That's yeah, it is a trap. a trap. I just want to say that we see there are some people saying yeah. hi and they're are saying there hello. There's no, there are no, they're just hi. <laughs> Hello's and drinks and Oh, I can't, I can't so, read. Why am I trying to read that? It's in a language I don't understand. <laughs> well, just know that we appreciate comments and those and everything. So before, so we're we're just about to to end this beautiful, um, you know, interaction with you guys. Uh, what is the? Oh, this is hard. It could be hard. What is the best advice? Okay. Okay, if I say the best, it could be that can be hard. One, what is one, what, what is one of the best advice you've ever had? Um, I've ever heard from someone else. Yeah, mm -hmm. like somebody came like uh, an advice that you like. I have one with Kurt Strassel. Oh uh, yeah, what, what is that one? Well, he said, "Oh, this is so embarrassing." But I was doing. I was not. I was. Uh, well, I was talking a lot, so yeah. I got a little nervous, and I had Kurt Strassel uh, in the room with me, and he put a hand on my shoulder, mm -hmm. and he said, oh, this is not, he said, Ricky, and then a long pause, where I kind of, sh you know, oh, yeah, I had free. And then he said, if you don't know what to say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was, yeah. at the moment, I didn't appreciate it. <laughs> But it's one of the best okay. advice I've had because I tend to talk when I get nervous. So, you know, shutting up uh, when I don't know what to say. That was just an example. What are one of the advice that you... Well, I think probably one of the best pieces of advice I ever got came from my mom, not from a, not from a psychologist. Uh, and she actually sent it to me in an email. And I'm going to forget the author right now, which I apologize for. Uh, and I'm not going to get this exactly right, but essentially, maybe somebody online will, will know who this is. Uh, she sent this to me saying, I don't, I don't want to go to the grave all pristine and pretty in a nice, you know, a, a, a put together way. I want to go to the grave beat up, used up, sliding in to the grave full on and saying, wow, what a ride. And I just, you know, love that she sent me that. So that's what I want for myself and for you, and I want that for my clients. I want everyone to say, wow, what a ride, when they, when they come to the end. I can't think of a more beautiful way to end this, Robin. Um, so our invitation for you guys is to go out, look for the, look for the happy, you know, use curiosity in a uh, you know flexible <laughs> functional way and let's go out with a bang basically right let's mm -hmm. you know when we come to the end of the life i hope we can all say you know we lived our life fully we had a blast yeah. i am so happy that you're in my life uh, <laughs> uh me and me as well it's really wonderful to be here it's you know and and, and i'm so happy that uh, all of you are either uh, watching this right now or watching this later um please you know send us comments hearts uh, we appreciate that afterwards that we go you know through the, the feedback from you guys it's amazing thank you for letting us be a part of your life this evening or whenever you're watching this and um 
you and I are going to go out and have a, a little so bite. Have a little bite. Have a little bite to taste eat. what's on the menu. Taste what's on the menu. <laughs> We're going to look at the entire menu and have a little taste. So, Robin, I love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>